Hey, how about now? Yeah. yeah, Steve just got zapped by this one. <laughs> Let's start in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the freedom that we have to come and worship you, that we can come and bow down to the Lord, our God, our Maker. For you are an awesome God, a loving God, and we just want to bring our worship and praise to you. We thank you so much that you pursue us so diligently, that you love us even though we are unlovable. Father, it is you who are so great, and we just come to you today opening your word to see and study your word and to know how we can be more like Christ so we can bring glory and honor to you. And we just thank you for the freedom that we have to come and be here. For each and every one that is here today, thank you, Father. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the last time... to speak with you, we talked about, um, kind of wrapped up John chapters 1 through 4. We started the series with John 3.16, for God so loved the world, and it's all because of God's love. What a crazy love that we have from a passionate God, that He would love us so much that while we're sinners, while we spit in His, his, his Son's face and everything... He still chooses to love us. It's just incredible. And that's why we're here. We're here to bring worship and praise to God. We are His children. We should be obedient. We should give Him the praise that He is so worthy of. So we talked about that. We talked a little bit about the encounter with Nicodemus. And we talked about what was true belief and what was not true belief. Because John says throughout his gospel that you need to believe. You need to believe. But yet Jesus walked away from some because He said, I don't believe you. And then we looked at the woman at the well, and we looked at her two different weeks. And I meant to, but I got so excited with encountering Jesus at the well that I forgot to tell you what the three must were. Did any of you catch that? Most of you? Hope. So in a bulletin two weeks ago, you had a line for three musts, but I didn't tell you what those were. Maybe you went back and found them. But today we'll go over them first so I don't forget and get excited. Because that's what happens when you truly meet Jesus at the well. You forget what you're doing and you leave your water pot right there because you're so excited about telling others about Jesus Christ, you forget why you came in the first place. So let's do that now. The first must in your bulletin, if you want to write this down, is from John 3, 7. 
And Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be born again. Born from above, born from God, born anew, born through His Spirit. We are born again to not live a life that is dominated by sin, that is controlled by sin, but a life that is instead born again to be empowered to live anew from the Holy Spirit. The second was found in John 3.30, and it says that you must become less, you must decrease, so that Jesus can increase in your life. And that was John 3.30. You must become less. You must become a servant of all. That's what Jesus did. He gave up His throne. He gave up His deity to come to this earth to serve us, to teach us, and to die for us. That's the kind of love that He and the Father has for us. And the third thing that we uh, went over was in John 4.24. You must worship in spirit and in truth. And I did a lot of research on this topic and everything. And you get so much about corporate worship. And corporate worship is definitely something that we should do because we're all God's children. We're a family. But I think it's so much more. We need to worship in spirit and truth in every step we take in life. That's what we're here to do. We need to get up in the morning, as Deuteronomy says, and we need to press it upon. We need to talk about it then. We need to press it upon our hearts. We need to tell our children about it on the way to work. We need to talk about it at work. We need to talk about it when we lie down at night. It needs to be our life. We don't need to take time out for God. We need to take time out for our life. God is our life. Without Him and His love that He sent Jesus Christ to die for us, once this life was over, we would spend eternity apart from Him in hell. But because He loved us so much, our life begins now. We are born again now to live a new life. Not to wait till another day. Not to wait till we accomplish this or that goal. But He needs to be the center of our life every day of our life. And if we live that kind of life, others will see it. Our children especially will see it. And they will be drawn to Him. I just read a book when we came back from the Bahamas. That's where I was getting the tan, if you didn't know. We went on a love songs couples getaway. The first thing we do when we get there, I think this is going to be nice and romantic. And the guy says, we don't have a king-size bed for you. We have two queens. And Sherry's like, Yes! So, you didn't, she didn't really say that. But I snore a lot. So, she doesn't like sleeping in near proximity to me at all, if that's possible. So, she would put oils and stuff on my feet. And they used to help, but I don't know. Sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. She said about the time we were leaving that my snoring went from... <laughs> to... Right? But too late. So, anyway... You need to praise God in everything that you do. There's so many things out there that are counterfeit these days. Friday night, when I was watching a little bit of television, relaxing, there was a 2020 special on, and I don't know if many of you saw this or not, and it talked about all the counterfeit things that are out there in life. (laughs) And... There was things from Timberland shoes that they went over that they ship over here and there's a little plate on the bottom of them that you pull that off and then underneath that you see the Timberland label to drugs that are are not approved in this country to even toothpaste. I've got videos that we're already out teaching and everything. There are many that will cry, Lord, Lord, and they do not know Him. and They're teaching different things. We need to make sure that we teach the truth. And if you're not genuine, your kids and the world will see right through you. They'll see that what you're teaching, what you're preaching, is not what you're living. And you will not be an example that you should be. The Father is seeking true worshipers. That means that there are false worshipers out there. Those that proclaim to know Jesus Christ and do not know Him. So if you get a chance, look at that. It's just it's amazing to see the products that are out there. And you look at them, and that Crest packaging looks just like it's a Crest toothpaste box that you would find in your house. But yet it came from wherever it came from and had traces of poison that you were putting in your body. Uh, another thing that they talked about was different drugs, and they had them filled with even plaster Paris putting in them for for filler and stuff. Now, I don't know what that will do to your body, but I want to feel like if I'm buying a product that I am getting what I am buying. And that needs to be so true in our lives. 
We need to be genuine, true believers, the kind of believers that the Father seeks afterwards. So buyer beware doesn't even come close to covering that, does it? So beware. God is seeking true worshipers. There are counterfeit ones out there. Do not be fooled. They're not just counterfeit in the way that, oh, you don't need God. There are many ways to God. But there are many that are saying Jesus Christ is the way. But if you simply believe, and that's all that you do, that that's good enough. Or whatever they're preaching that is not biblical. We need to combat that. And we need to combat that not only in our words, but in our lives. So that we are the true believers. Authentic believers. So that when you see a fish symbol, I read a um, thing about a story where a guy was got in this neighborhood and was beat up and bleeding to death. And he saw a van drive by with a Christian fish symbol on the back. And they didn't even slow down. Now what do you think about that? Do you think they were genuine believers? Then there was a guy that rode by on the bicycle. And he said, this is a bad neighborhood. I'll call for somebody as soon as I get to a safe place. And he kept on. And then there was a little old lady that stopped by, picked up the man, put her in his car, never said a word about Jesus or anything else, but took him to the hospital. Now, who do you think seemed to be a more genuine Christian, even though words weren't spoken? That's the kind of examples that I'm talking about. God knows a man's heart. He knows our motives. And Jesus walked away from many of those in the first chapters of John that said, we believe, but yet they did not truly believe. The first encounter we have of true belief was the woman at the well who forgot about everything she was doing, didn't even understand what was going on, but she realized that she was a sinner and needed a Savior. And Jesus Christ came to be that Savior. But there is a day coming also when Jesus will return again. And He didn't come to judge this time, but next time He will come to judge. And He will be the only way to reach God the Father, the only way to see the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. And at that day, we will be judged for what we do. We will stand accountable. Whether we have been born again, whether we have decreased, and whether we are the true worshipers that the Father seeks, those are things that we must do. Those are not optional things. Jesus is clear. He said over and over to Nicodemus, we, you must be born again. But Nicodemus didn't get it, did he? Hebrews 9.27 says this, Just as people are destined to die once and after that face the judgment. Acts 17, 30 and 31 says, In the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. There is no excuse. Matthew 25, 31 and 32 say this, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And then in verse 46 says, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteousness to eternal life. See, we've all been faced with the question here that the woman the well was faced with, that Nicodemus was faced with, do you truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that you're a sinner and need a Savior? If you do, you must be born again. You have the Spirit of God residing in your heart. He lives with you every day. Wow! We are so blessed that God has given us that precious gift. But yet so many times... We act like we don't even realize it or we don't appreciate that gift. If we have that gift, we must decrease. We must not worry about the things in our lives that are our needs, wants, and desires as much. We need to worry about what God's goals and plans and desires are for us. Instead of saying this life is too short, I need to do this and that before I get too old to do it. We need to say this life is too short. I need to reach this and that person for Jesus Christ. I need to be the example to my children. I need to be consistent in the way I live, not just the way I talk, so that they will know that we are genuine articles, that we are true believers and worshipers, not counterfeit. Nicodemus walked away. What a sad thing. He thought he had it all figured out. He had lived a life totally of works, 
where he thought and knew in his heart, no matter how strong his belief was, it was a lie, that he of all people was going to heaven because he did all, spent all of his life trying to keep the law. But yet he didn't understand that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. It doesn't matter if you think that you're good enough because no one is good enough. No one is righteous. No, not one. And for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how much God loves us. Galatians 2.16 says, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. Faith comes from the Greek word pistis, which means a strong and welcome conviction or belief. It's very similar to the word believe. That Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. The second must that we found in John 3 was we must decrease so that He must increase. And what a good example that is for our lives. Because in the United States we are so blessed and we think we're so deserved. Because we are so blessed. You look at anybody out there today and you look at all the iPads and iPhones. Why do you think they named them that? Because it's all about I. It's instant gratification. That I can get instant access to whatever I want now. And I want it now and I want it my way. But that is so different than what John the Baptist did. His disciples came up to him and said, Jesus is over with his disciples. And they're, just, they're baptizing more people than we are. Aren't you worried? that your stature is going to go down? Aren't you worried that this good that we have, all these people coming to us, is going to go away? And he said, no, I'm not worried a bit. He said, that's the plan. He said, I must decrease so that he must increase. He had it figured out. Verse 29 says that he was joyous. Not only was he joyous, but his joy was complete. He had done what he was called to do. And now he was less so that Jesus could become more. That's God's plan. And God's plan is going to happen whether you want to participate in it or not. The thing is, is we have the right and ability as children of God to be able to participate in it. Hallelujah. It's such a wonderful thing. During Jesus' conversation with the sinful Samaritan woman at the well, the third thing was mentioned, and that was we must worship in spirit and truth. John 4, 23 and 24, as we read earlier, it says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and His worshipers must worship Him in spirit and truth. The Greek word for faith was pistis. It is a noun. Whereas the Greek word for believe is pisteo and it is a verb. You must believe, you must have the verb before you can have the noun of the faith. You must believe so that you can have faith. Pisteo means to believe or be convinced of something. But you've seen before, we saw it in John, and that's why I wanted to wrap it all together, that many said they believed. But Jesus answered with the same word and said, I don't believe you. And He walked away from them. Because He knows whether their faith is genuine or not. They saw signs and wonders and said, Well, this guy's got to be from from God. That's why Nicodemus came at night. He didn't want to risk it. Uh, That's the way I feel. That might not be the reason. But he came at night because in my mind, he wasn't willing to go all the way. If his answer wasn't what he thought he should have got, then he could sneak away into the darkness again. But Jesus came to be the light, to expose darkness. And we are called to be that same light. There's no other option. There's no maybe, there's no later. We are called to live a life that is light to this world. We must be born again. We must become less so that He can become more. And we must worship in spirit and truth. And yes, that means corporately together. We are a family. I've talked about relationships since the 1st of January and how important it is so that we can see that we have to love our spouses. We have to love our children. We have to love our church. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's what we're going to be doing for all of eternity. So why would we not want to start now? Period. 
But we must start now. Because Jesus died just as much for me as He died for John, as He died for Lowell, as whoever He died for. Whether I like any one of them or don't like anyone, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm to love my brothers and sisters. I'm supposed to love them to the point of sacrificial love if that's what it takes. That's what Jesus Christ has called us to do. That's part of that worship. And we can't worship in spirit without having the spirit living in us. We can worship in spirit now because Jesus Christ came. What a blessing that we have. The the disciples walked and talked with Jesus, but until the Spirit came upon them at Pentecost, they had never experienced such a thing. And then if you read on in Acts, they were changed men. Totally changed, relying on the Spirit of God. What a difference the power of the Spirit of God can make in someone's life. Do you truly believe? That's the question. Do you have saving belief? Do you see the difference? Nicodemus did not understand, and he walked away. The Samaritan woman didn't understand, but she didn't walk away. She told everyone, could this be? And they came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The concepts of belief and faith occur 550 times in Scripture. They are the most frequent instruction or command in the New Testament and in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Belief and faith are fundamental to our relationship with our God. And remember, God is seeking those kind of worshipers. He's not just casually looking, but He's seeking for something. He's craving for it. He's looking high and low, turning over everything that He can to see if He can find those true believers. Because obviously there's many that call themselves believers and are counterfeit. God loves us so much that He gave His Son to die for us. What an incredible thing that is. It's nothing to do with who we are, but everything to do with who He is. Anyone that teaches anything different is counterfeit. If they're counterfeit, they are an anti-Christ. They are anti-Jesus. Grace, grace, God's grace is what saves us. It's greater than all of our sins. And it has called us to live a life that is righteous and holy as true worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. And where are you going to get the truth except in God's Word? So many times we search for the truth in so many different places. But beware of that because a lot of times you'll find counterfeit. God is so gracious and so kind to us that not only did Jesus Christ come and make this Word living, But we have this Word. We can worship it freely. We can research it. We can study it. We can meditate on it. But yet we think so many times that we need to worry more about food for our body than we need to worry about food for our spirit. And Jesus is clear of that. When Jesus started His ministry, Satan tried to tempt Him at first. He'd gone in the desert and He was physically had no food. He was lacking strength and everything. And Satan came to Him and said... Turn these stones into bread. Take care of your physical needs first. It's what's rational to us. Because once we fill up, then we can go do this. I don't want to miss a meal any day if I'm going out to tell people about Jesus Christ. I sure want to go eat at Denny's first or something. Right? That's just natural. It's logical. Because then if I am filled up, I can do my job better, right? But Jesus was more reliant upon the Spirit to fill Him. He was more concerned about doing what God sent him to do, what he was called to do. That was his job. That was why he was sent here. Some people say that we're studying James now, and some people say that James teaches against Jesus Christ. You find that quite commonly if you start doing some research on James. Well, is that true? Because my Bible is all cohesive. It's all the Word of God. James is actually, when you want to say that he's teaching salvation through works, if that's the way you want to look at it and read it, he really seems to be teaching the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught himself. So how could he be teaching that if he's teaching Christ's words himself? But if you look at it and study that, you'll see many people that say that James is teaching works for salvation. No, James is saying that if you are saved, you should have works. That should be what makes it obvious. Not that that's what saves you by any means. So Paul teaches that you're saved by grace, right? So maybe the two of them conflict. Not at all. Paul teaches that you must be a servant of all also. 
Most all his letters start out with, I am a servant. So he definitely has the works to show it also. A life that is built on worshiping in spirit and truth has deeds. It's obvious. I've said it before, if you're still breathing, then you should be doing because it's what you're called to do. It's not what saved you. Simply believing is what saved you if you simply have the belief that you need. Paul says this in Romans six seventeen and 18. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Verse 22 and 23. But now that you have been set free from sin and you have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So he teaches works also. But neither one of them teaches anything different than what Jesus Christ teaches. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. In John chapter 1, he said, follow me, come and see. It's a journey we're on called life. But remember, it's his story, not our story. You must be born again. You must decrease so He can increase. And you must worship in spirit and truth. Satan is out there to deceive you. That's his job. He doesn't stop. In fact, the more that you start to do something, the more that he's going to attack you because he wants to make you have a life that is worthless. He wants you not to bring others to Jesus Christ. He doesn't mind if you're counterfeit at all. Because if you counterfeit, you could be feeding others poison, couldn't you? Just like you get in that toothpaste. You could be drawing others away from Christ rather than drawing them to, to Him. That's His job. He's not going to give up. He's not going to get tired like we are. He's going to continue to pursue you like a lion pursues its prey. Just waiting till He can devour and destroy you. Matthew 4.4 4 was when Jesus answered Satan and says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now think about that. How many times are you feeding your spirit? How can you worship in spirit and truth if you're not feeding it? Like I said, so much of our time today is we will take time out to pray. We will take time out to read our Bible. When we should take time out for that meal. We shouldn't feel bad at all. I left last Sunday think, bat, feeling bad at first saying, I forgot to mention, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before, that I forgot to mention the three things that I must do. And then all of a sudden God hit me. He said, but you came to the well. You were doing what the Spirit led you to do, and you completely forgot about that. And it just overwhelmed me that I was doing what the Spirit called me to do. Even though in my eyes, boy, I totally blew that. I forgot to mention the three things that was in the bulletin. But I think we had a good sermon. I don't know what you think. But we had an encounter with the Spirit, an encounter with Jesus at the well. So what that I forgot what I came to do? Because I was caught up in telling the story of Jesus Christ. So, so what if I forgot to eat dinner that night? I think I could go without a few myself. I don't think it would hurt anything. That's the kind of life we need to live to worship in spirit and truth. The Samaritan woman tried to change the subject away from her sins. Did you catch that? And we do that so often. We say, well, I really want to go to church today and I really want to get involved, but then we throw something in. But it's the only day I have off. We say, boy, I just really want to go to this Bible study, but I don't like so-and-so, so I don't want to go. So we make excuses. Whatever the things are in our life, I don't have time. I'm not knowledgeable enough. I'm not sure if this is what God is calling me to do. We make excuses. God is calling you to worship in spirit and truth every day of your life. To fill up on His Spirit. To fill up on His Word, His truth. So that you can tell others about Jesus Christ. It's what we must do. Jesus addresses the woman's uh, diversion plainly. He goes right back to witnessing to her. Do you realize that's what He's doing? He's witnessing to her about the gospel message. When we were in the Bahamas, we left out of a place eating and we were walking down the street and this guy says, Hey, Mom, come here. You're not drunk enough yet. And I said, I don't drink. He said, Why not? Everyone needs to be drunk in the Bahamas. I said, I'm high already on life. 
He said, that's not high enough, man. I said, well, I'm high on Jesus then, brother. He said, that's high enough, man, and shook my hand. (laughs) He thought it was great. There's so many opportunities to tell others about Jesus. And he didn't offer me any liquor anymore. (laughs) So it kind of shut that down. Now, whether he thought I was true or counterfeit, I don't know. But there's so many times in our life when we can tell others about Jesus Christ. He needs to be what we're worried about. Not worried about filling our bodies with food or desires of the flesh. We're not, sin, we're not uh, slaves to that sin anymore. Jesus came to set us free so that we could be truly free indeed. But that means if you want to discover true freedom, then you need to become a slave of Christ. When we were at the water park, at the thing, the resort, there was a river ride that I kept hearing people refer to as the Lazy River. And there was nothing lazy about this river at all. Not even dwell on me. That river was not lazy. And I got to looking. They do have a lazy river. It's in another part of the park. It's a quarter mile ride and it's a lazy river. We were on this one. Let me find it and read it to you. Plunge into Atlantis. Paradise Islands River Rides. Try the lazy river ride near Beach Tower. Wait a minute. I didn't go near that. For tranquil, relaxing time, float along the quarter mile lazy river. Or, dive into the current, where resort guests are propelled along a mile-long river in their inner tubes via water escalators, rolling waves, extreme rapids powered by master blaster technology. See, if you don't know what ride you're on, you're in for a surprise, aren't you? But the problem is, is we think so many times that we're on one ride when we need to be on a different ride. We're on a ride that is empowered by the Spirit of God. Wow. That's not Master Blaster technology. That's sovereign Godhead that He would let His Spirit reside into us. Jesus told His disciples that you will do much greater things than I did because you have the Spirit of God inside of you. That's crazy. But you've got to know what ride you're on. And I don't know, I never heard one person (laughs) say that they didn't think they were on the lazy river. Everybody was saying, that lazy river is crazy. Well, it wasn't a lazy river. It was a current. Just think if you plug into that current and power that the Holy Spirit can have in your life. What a difference it can make. Our bodies are temples. And we've got to live as so. Before, in the Old Testament times, you had to go to the temple and worship. Now we can worship in a spirit in our own body because Christ resides in us through His Spirit. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. That's the temple of God. He resides in us now. What a crazy thing, but it's the truth. What a blessed thing. God resides in us. We carry Him around wherever we go. And all we've got to do is plug into that current to receive the power from Him. But we need to feed ourselves spiritually. We need to gather with believers. We need to realize what ride we're on. This is God's story. And God is seeking out true worshipers. That's the kind of worshipers that He seeks. Genuine worshipers. That means God craves, searches for, and demands believers that worship in spirit and truth. How many of you ever had a milk cow? A few. What happens to a milk cow if you stop milking it? So you've got to continually realize that you've got to milk the cow, right? And here's, here's kind of how the process happens. First, you take a cow... It can be any old cow, can it? It doesn't have to be a Jersey milk cow. It can be any type of cow. And she has life come inside of her. And then she starts producing milk. So a cow must first give birth so that it can produce milk. Then it becomes not a cow, but a dairy cow. Just as a person must be born again to become a Christian or like Christ. Once a cow gives birth, her body converts grass into producing it to milk. So a cow must eat to produce the milk that she needs to give to her calves. 
calf or calves. A Christian is born again by the Spirit and must constantly feed on God's Word and be filled and nourished with the Spirit if their life is going to produce and be like Christ and provide milk for others. Becoming less so that Jesus can be more. We've already seen born again and we've already seen the becoming less. If you take a calf away from its mother, then the calf can keep on producing. And it can produce, a single cow can produce 20,000 pounds of milk over and above what her calf consumes in one year. That's incredible. Now apply that biblically. If you would let the Spirit take control, what you could produce for Jesus Christ. A cow doesn't choose to become a milk cow. We have to choose to make it a milk cow. Just like we have to choose to believe. But if we stop there, how much milk are we going to produce? If we let God feed us through His Spirit, if we realize that we've become a milk cow, a Christian now, not just a person, how much can God produce through us to feed others the gospel message of Jesus Christ? What a difference it will be if we plug into that current, into that spirit, and worship in spirit and in truth. You've got to remember what ride you're on. You've got to remember what purpose you're here for. You've got to remember whose story it is. You must be born again. You must decrease so that He can become more, so He, he may increase. And we must worship in spirit and truth. That's the kind of believers that the Father is searching for. Let's pray. Father, we come for you today as your children. Lord, help us to be obedient children. Help us to be sold out for Jesus. Lord, you've baptized us with your spirit. And your word says that if we ask, you will continually come upon us with your spirit and fill us. And Father, I ask that for each and every person here that is willing to pray that prayer for themselves. Lord, that this may be a church that is on fire for serving you that doesn't let things of this world hinder us from our job, that we provide the milk and nourishment, and that you take us on one crazy, incredible ride, that our life begins now because we are born again now, not later, to become less so that you can become more. Lord, just pour your Spirit out upon this place. Bless each and every one who takes a chance to follow you to follow you with all of their heart, all of their mind, all of their body, and all of their strength. And just show them that you are God, that you are in control and you have the best things in store for them. Why wait for heaven? Why not be born again to live a new life now? Help those that are struggling with sin. Help them to bring it to you, Father. Lay it down and take it from them. Jesus said to lay your burdens down, that he would take them. That His load is easy. We just sometimes don't think that you know what's best. Or we're selfish and still putting ourselves before you. Whatever the reasons are, Father, let us give it to you today. Let us to be a church that truly loves you and makes a difference in this world and feeds those who are hungry. You have given us so much. Let us give back to you so that others can see Jesus Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.